Hello, my name is Darko Pracic and I'm lead environment artist here at Embark Studios in Stockholm. I worked with 3D art in games and film for the past 13 years. My current focus is to convert old and manual workflows into procedural and automated solutions. Today I would like to show you how we use photogrammetry at Embark Studios and how we've automated that entire pipeline. After which, I would like to share with you a simple guide on how you can scan something with your mobile phone and process it with a software called Alice Vision Meshroom. Embark Studios was founded in Stockholm, Sweden in 2018 by a group of people who wanted to change the games industry forever. Our vision is to be able to build AAA quality games but with smaller teams, and this by seriously fixing old and costly workflows. Apart from that vision, we also want to democratize game creation. We are building our own game creation platform with Rust, and it relies heavily on AI-generated content. We have set high goals for ourselves at Embark, but each and every one of us believes in that goal, and we strive for not just building great games, but also fundamentally how we build them. Before I continue with my photogrammetry presentation, I would like to share with you three videos. Two from our photogrammetry trips to Iceland and Tenerife, and a third one uh, showing our first environment in our real engine, built with photogrammetry and procedural tools. You can watch these videos later on medium.com on our page. I'm Andrew Hamilton and I work as art director at Embark Studios in Stockholm. What you're looking at is an early real-time environment test that we've recently wrapped up in Unreal Engine, created by three experienced artists in a very short three weeks. Our goal was to see how far we could push visual fidelity on a large scale, employing efficient workflows with a completely dynamic weather and lighting system. This is a massive 256 square kilometer map, made by utilizing real-world scan data and procedural placement tools. It's an early test, but we're encouraged by the progress and how a small team with a blank canvas and creative mindset can achieve impressive results. 
Here are the things that I will talk about today. We've already been through the introduction. Next, I will talk about what photogrammetry is. After that, I will show you why we use it at Embark. Uh, then I will show how we automated the entire process of getting a real-world object into a real engine as a game-ready asset. And finally, I will have a short tutorial on how you can scan something yourself with your mobile phone and get a finished 3D asset in a free open source software. So let's talk about what photogrammetry means for us artists in the games industry. Simply put, what we mean with photogrammetry in the games industry is the process of taking hundreds of photos of an object and reading them into a photogrammetry software like Reality Capture, Agisoft Metashape, or Alice Vision Meshroom and generate a 3D point cloud. After that, the software builds a high resolution mesh with color information on the vertices or as a texture map. Lastly, we create low poly, UV map it, bake the high resolution data and import the finished asset into your game engine. Photogrammetry can be a useful tool to improve an artist's workflow especially if the ambition is to create game worlds based on or somewhat grounded in reality. Not only does it let an artist reach a high fidelity of realistic visuals, but it also greatly increases the speed at which it takes to create the content. Using photogrammetry was a no-brainer at Embark. Our ambition is to create a grounded and believable game world at a high fidelity. There are a ton of good reasons to use photogrammetry, but like most things, there are some cons as well. I'll go through the pros first. 1. Recreating photorealistic nature by hand is near impossible. 2. Even though there is some time that gets spent on generating the high-resolution scanned assets, it is nothing compared to the time of manually creating this type of content. 3. The experience of being out in the world and observing nature and objects is bringing people back to old-school art. It is common today with all the great digital tools for artists to get away from viewing the world around them and using it to grow their artistic eye. The cons. Uh, one, hardware. You do need more powerful computers and a good DSLR camera to produce really great results. Two, availability. Relying on photogrammetry might put constraints on what you can put into your game if you aren't able to find and scan the assets you need. Artists still need to build their skills for creating content when real-world assets aren't available to them. 3. Gamification. Game assets have higher demands than just looking good. Creating a low poly with a reasonable tri triangle count is easier if you sculpt a blocky rock or cliff. But if you scan your assets, they probably have a lot more complex shapes that make them look great, but you need to be able to support these shapes with enough triangles. You also need to create reasonable collision that doesn't cost too much. I will now show how we've optimized the old and manual workflow of getting a scanned object into the game with automated processes. Previously, you would have to build a low poly mesh and UV map it manually in a 3D package like Blender, Maya or Max. After that, you export your low poly and load it into XNormal where you bake your textures. And then you take your baked textures into either Photoshop or Painter and delight them. We took the mesh, bake and texture polish steps that were previously manual and automated them into a tool that was built in Houdini. This tool creates a low poly UVs, bakes textures and does simple delighting all without any user input. So I think it's time for us to get into photogrammetry from a more practical perspective. Here are some quick guidelines. Sharpness over brightness. Set your camera up so that you can get as sharp an image as possible, even if you have to sacrifice brightness. The software can't guess what a blurry mess of an image is trying to represent. Coverage. Cover the entire object thoroughly. The best result is achieved by having a dense and even photo coverage over the entire object. Hardware. You will need a decent computer with at least 32 GB of RAM, and a good DSLR camera is recommended. Diffuse light condition. Always try to capture your object on cloudy days. The sun casts shadows and creates dramatic hue shifts that are hard to remove afterwards. Manual settings on the camera. If using a phone, be sure to install a third-party camera app that allows for you to control the ISO, shutter speed and aperture. Clean the surrounding area of your object. Any debris that might occlude it is good to remove. 
The quality of the photos are more important than the choice of photogrammetry software. On to the next topic, the camera. There are three main features of the camera that we will discuss. The aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Aperture. Aperture allows you to gather more light into your sensor in your camera at the cost of more depth of field. A more open aperture, for example f1.4, will let in more light but will produce a short depth of field, which is bad for us. When you have a short depth of field while capturing a cliff or a rock, only the surface closest to you will be sharp in the image. Shutter speed. While out on the field, time is of the essence, and placing a tripod and moving it for every photo isn't an option. The way we deal with this is to always capture the object with the camera in hand. The downside of this is that the images can be blurry. If your shutter speed isn't higher than about 1 250th of a second. If you're a really steady person with steady hands, you might go down to 1 1 205th of a second, but I personally feel that you should never risk it. You often just get one chance to gather content and you should make sure that all your images are sharp when you come home to process them. ISO. ISO is the sensitivity of the camera's sensor and can help when capturing in dark environments. Depending on your equipment, higher ISO might create a very noisy image, but with modern DSLRs, I would say that it is fine to go to a maximum ISO of 6400 if necessary. Here's the cheat sheet, and you can see all three variables presented together and their effects. As previously mentioned, our main goal is sharpness. Adjust your camera so that your image is bright enough, clear, and super sharp. Next up, some guidelines on how to capture objects when out on the field. We want to have at least full hemispherical coverage of an object. If you are capturing big roots and branches, be sure to get down and dirty and capture the bottom size as well. When capturing a surface, you take photos in a grid-like manner in rows and columns across the entire surface. Here's an example of a clear and sharp image versus one that is slightly blurred by the depth of field. The blurred one on the left does not look horrible, but you have to remember that the software does not see the picture as us humans. It is important that every feature is sharp and clear so that the software can see recurring patterns, contrasts and features in the photos. Be sure to check the white balance when capturing. It might be set to AWB, which means it will be automatic. This is a problem because it will change for each photograph, giving you different colors each time. Be sure to set it manually to something like cloudy, daylight or indoor fluorescent. It is also important to keep all the images evenly exposed, which is doable by setting the previously mentioned settings, aperture, shutter speed and ISO manually. The software we will be using is Alice Vision Meshroom. The great thing about this software is that it is open source and completely free. It isn't as good as its competitors, but with good images you can go a long way with Meshroom. When you're ready to bring your photos into Meshroom, there really isn't much to the process. You drag the photos into the program, and then the first step after saving the project is to generate a point cloud, which you do by right-clicking on the Structure from Motion node, and then click on Compute. This process will take some time. It depends a lot on how many photos you've taken and how po powerful your machine is. The most important thing is to have a lot of RAM so that your computer does not crash. If your point cloud looks good and your camera seem to be aligned correctly, then move forward and generate the mesh and texture. And that's basically it. The assets generated will end up in subfolders where your saved meshroom project is. After that, you grab those files and produce a low poly mesh in your favorite 3D package, and then you bake textures from your scanned asset. We use XNormal, which is free and fast and can deal with a lot of polygons for really heavy and high resolution scans. It has been a great pleasure to share all of this with you. I would like to finish the presentation off with another video which resembles the one I started it with. This time you will see the scanned Iceland nature content as finished assets in an environment in Unreal Engine.
That's all for me. Thank you for your time.